Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today. Welcome to the Clinical Trial Readiness Keynote Session. My name is Beth Bowerman and I am the Research Services Coordinator here at the National Ataxia Foundation. We have some great things coming up in this session. We will hear from both Drs. Liana Rosenthal and Drs. Melissa Beiner about the science behind clinical trials. And then we will hear from Christy Taylor who shares her experience participating in clinical trials and how participating in those trials empowers her. After that, we'll have some open question and answer time to close out the session. Before we get started with all of that, I want to highlight NAF's new clinical trial readiness initiative, PrepRare. PrepRare officially launched in early 2022, and it's a series of educational materials and bi-monthly webinars for those in the ataxia community to educate themselves on how to become clinical trial ready. NAF hosts these bi-monthly webinars with representatives from pharmaceutical companies, ataxia researchers, and others to help the ataxia community members prepare for these upcoming trials. Our first webinar was done in late February with our very own CSO, Lauren Moore, talking about her role as NAF's first chief scientific officer. A recording of that can be found on our YouTube page, so please check it out if you weren't able to attend live. Our next webinar will be coming up in April, so make sure you're signed up to receive emails from NAF and keep a lookout for information and registration regarding that webinar. Additionally, you can check out NAF's website for articles and other posts on key topics related to clinical trial readiness, part of PrepRare. These topics include informed consent, placebo, COVID-19 in clinical trials, and what inclusion and exclusion material means in clinical trials. New PrepRare articles will be posted every other month through NAF's e-news, so make sure you're signed up for those as well. Keep a lookout for that, and if there's any other topics you would like to hear from NAF about clinical trial readiness, please put those in the chat, and we will keep track of those. On that note, I will, I will pass it over to Melissa Beiner and Liana Rosenthal to speak on the science behind clinical trials. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'd like to first thank NAF for having uh, myself and Dr. Rosenthal here today to talk to you about the process of drug development. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this talk. Um, Dr. Rosenthal and I are gonna cover a lot of topics today surrounding the process of drug development, and we're gonna go through them fairly quickly, but I just wanna let everybody know that there's gonna be time at the end for an open Q&A where you can ask any questions and you can also float any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, my name is Dr. Melissa Beiner and I am the Director of Research and Development at Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. And I am also the medical lead for our clinical trials in spinocerebellar ataxia. And my name is Dr. Liana Rosenthal. I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology at Johns Hopkins and I direct the Johns Hopkins Ataxia Center. I'm also the co-director on what we call the Natural History Study, or the CRC-SCA, which is one of the studies that we're going to be talking about today. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We're looking forward to a great session. So today we're going to be talking first about clinical trial overviews and sort of the drug development process. And we're going to be giving you some terms to hopefully make the rest of the talk a little bit more clear. We're gonna talk about clinical trial readiness and the challenges inherent to rare diseases, and then how clinical trials contribute to advancing research. We're also gonna be talking about NAF and its role in accelerating drug development and align, aligning the regulators, the clinicians, and the industry. So first, an overview of research. When we talk about research, there is basic science research, and clinical research. So first, basic science research. Basic science research is an investigation of a subject to increase knowledge and understanding about it. Basic science in its purest forms often is knowledge for knowledge sake, research for research sake. It usually performs research, usually describes, excuse me, research performed on cells, animals. Um, it's important to note though, that this knowledge for the sake of knowledge can then often be translated into other things. For example, here, I talk about an atomic clock that is critical and is now used for satellite-based GPS, which is something we use all the time when driving around. In terms of clinical research, we are referring to any research that involves humans. That is clinical research. 
with its goal to improve human health or increase understanding of human biology. And clinical research is then further subdivided into observational studies and interventional studies. So when we talk about observational studies, we're saying we observe. And we use that term kind of broadly because we mean that we observe both clinical assessments. So, you know, when you go to your doctor's office and you do finger to nose, that's a clinical assess assessment. And we can observe that in research. But then we also say that we are observing blood and spinal fluid, imaging, and a number of other things in order to understand more about human biology and in the case of anyone with ataxia, what's gone wrong in those, in those systems. In terms of interventional re research or clinical trials, we want to determine if our intervention changes an underlying condition. So we want to determine if people who exercise do better than those who don't. People who take a certain drug do better than those who don't. There are a number of observational studies and a number of interventional clinical trials that you have probably heard of that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of, of slides. So again, though, there's basic science research and then clinical research, and clinical research can be observational or interventional. So some examples of observational studies, there's the Framingham Heart Study, and that study has actually been critical to our understanding of high blood pressure and the problems that it causes, for example. Um, the U.S. Census is also an observational study. And then when we also talk about COVID vaccine monitoring, that is an observational study. So this is, you know, all the people who get the vaccine in the population, once it underwent its emergency use approval, what happens to those people? How do they do? The things that you look at about how, you know, people who are vaccinated have lower mortality than those who don't. That's vaccine monitoring, and that is an observational study. So next slide. In terms of clinical trials, every prescription drug or vaccine you have ever taken was once a part of a clinical trial. So antibiotics are always part of clinical trials, birth control pills, blood pressure medications. Some of these medications that your doctor may have put you on related to your ataxia, like rilazole or formunipuridine, amantadine, baclofen, all of those medications all went through clinical trials and then also the COVID-19 vaccines. So those initial early studies on the COVID-19 vaccines that then led to the emergency use authorization, those were a clinical trial because in those studies, they specifically monitored people who got the vaccine and people who didn't and who was more likely to get COVID and who wasn't. So we can have drugs or vaccines that are both in clinical trials and then subsequently we observe them in the real world once they're approved. Here are some research terms to know related to clinical trials. And these are things that we're gonna be using in terms that we talk about frequently. So the first term is a placebo. A placebo is a substance or thing with no therapeutic effect. So in that clinical trial that I was talking about, how people who take the drug versus people who don't, usually in any clinical trial, there are people who take the drug, but the people who don't are taking a placebo. They still put a pill in their mouth, but it is a placebo pill. It's a substance or thing with no therapeutic effect. Double blind means the researchers and the patients do not know if they're taking placebo or an active medication or intervention. So everyone is taking a pill and the researchers don't know and the patients don't know if they are on the pill, the actual active drug, or if they're on placebo. It's a double blind study. In terms of a study being powered, what we're looking at there is the ability of a study to detect a difference if a difference actually exists. And we oftentimes talk about that in the context of needing to enroll a certain number of people in the study. And we do that because we need the study to be adequately powered to be able to detect a difference between the active substance, the drug, and the placebo. And the other thing we frequently talk about, we're gonna be talking about over the course of this talk, are endpoints. And endpoints are an event or outcome that is measured objectively to determine whether or not the intervention being studied is beneficial. So if you are in a study related to glucose levels or sugar levels for your diabetes, 
We give some people the diabetes drug. We give some people the placebo. The end point, the thing that we're measuring are sugar, our blood sugar levels. And we use that end point, that blood sugar level, to see if people who are on the active drug have a lower blood sugar level than those who are on placebo. And people who are on the active drug, how many side effects do they get compared to the placebo? But the end point that we're looking at, the thing that's important, is their sugar levels. And one of the things we're doing is spending a lot of time on within ataxia is looking at different endpoints to try to identify better endpoints for ataxia. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, background research in science and broadly about clinical trials and interventional trials. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about what do we need to have in place in order to design and implement a clinical trial in the real world. So what are the pieces of information that we need? Uh, one thing that's very handy is clinical trial experience, right? So um, what, what has been the experience of other people using other interventions in a given patient population and how have they measured changes in those patients over time and how did it work? The other thing we need to understand is also the natural progression of the disease. So the clinical course of a disease in a patient. So what are their beginning symptoms? How do they progress over time with their symptoms? And how long do these symptoms progress? And that's data that's largely gathered through what Dr. Rosenthal talked about a little earlier, natural history studies. So these are studies where patients have no intervention. They just come in and they have various things measured. They can be um, different proteins in blood or cerebral spinal fluid. They can have some imaging done like an MRI of the brain. And then also what we call clinical outcome assessments that measure changes over time in their disease course. And it gives us really important information about the disease overall. Um, examples of those in spinocerebellar ataxia, right, are the Ready Scott trial and the CRCSCA trials that are ongoing in the United States. And also in Europe, there's a big study looking at SCA called the Euroska study. Uh, the other thing we need that Dr. Rosenthal talked about a little bit are outcome measures. So how do we measure what the effect a drug is having over time in a patient population? Um, and those can be more qualitative measures. So they can be a clinician looking at a patient and assessing on different parameters, how they're progressing over time. So for SCA, I'm gonna give you the example of the Sarah scale, right? So your clinician will look at your balance with the gait item and the sitting items and how you're speaking, and you can measure changes in that over time. Those are qualitative outcome measures. Then there are more specific quantitative outcome measures that Again, the perfect example would be the measure of your blood glucose that we just talked about. That's a quantitative measure. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit now about what are the challenges in doing this. You need all these things to put together the design of a, of a clinical trial, but that becomes particularly challenging in the rare disease space. And the reason is a lot of this background doesn't exist. So we've been talking specifically about SCA. So I'll highlight that. What is our clinical trial experience in SCA, right? We have very little. Um, Biohaven did the first registrational trial in the country in SCA. There have been a couple studies out of Europe. So it didn't, doesn't give you a lot of background to go with as opposed to say, for example, diabetes. Again, the classic example of a very common disease that's been studied for decades and decades over time, both in the research laboratories and in clinical trials. Um, we do have a lot of natural history data, but um, we need to collect a lot more. And part of those studies, part of the reason those studies are so important is because they will help us define quantitative outcome measures. We're behind in that in rare disease spaces overall. And they're very important in the design of clinical trials because they're very important in having us be able to assess whether a drug or a procedure helps patient symptoms. Um, this is just to highlight uh, how the FDA is aligned with all of these different components as being critical to developing a clinical trial. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here, which is something great that the FDA has been very instrumental in now since, you know, I guess for two decades, um, hearing the patient voice. 
because what's really important in developing these outcome measures is what symptoms are important to patients. We can measure different outcomes, right? But what do they mean to patients? So what symptoms of a disease um, are, have the greatest impact on your ability to carry out activities of daily living? What symptoms are the most important symptoms that patients want to see an improvement in? So using the example of SCA, that could be your ability to communicate language. That could be your balance, how you're able to walk across the floor, but it can also be a whole host of things. So the FDA has been instrumental in having hosting what are called patient-focused drug development groups, where huge groups of patients come in and they actually speak about what their symptoms are, what their most bothersome symptoms are, and what they want to see addressed with a given intervention. Um, and the National Ataxia Foundation actually hosted the first patient-focused drug development meeting for SCA, for ataxia overall, and gathered some really, really important data. And all of that becomes very important when you're designing a clinical trial. Um, so again, to highlight the importance of natural history studies and observational studies, which are what we use as background guidance when we develop protocols in, in the drug industry, um, how does natural history of the disease help? We talked about what that is, but how does it help us? It helps us figure out what patients we're going to look at, right? So in a disease like SCA, where there's a lot of heterogeneity in patient symptoms. So that just means how patient symptoms differ even patient to patient, but more importantly, genotype to genotype. So while there are some overarching symptoms that all patients with SCA have, there are some symptoms that are very specific to the different SCAs. And we need to figure out when we're looking at a clinical outcome measure, what are the best patients to get into that trial? So sometimes it's gonna be patients who are progressing the most rapidly. Sometimes it's gonna be patients who have a given set of symptoms that we're using an endpoint to measure. So we're gonna be able to pick up an effect in a drug. Um, the natural history studies also help us gather data about the epidemiology of SCA, whether it's across the United States or across the globe. So how many patients are there? How many patients are there with a given genotype? and where are they in the country? That's important not only for recruitment for clinical trials, so finding patients to, to join clinical trials and also natural history studies, but it also becomes really important when you market a drug because you have to go to health insurance companies and say to them, look, this is how many patients we have. We're a little behind in that in SCA, but there are some definite initiatives to help us gather that data the natural history studies, but also the NAF genetic testing initiative, which right now is focusing on SCA3, but um, it's helping make genetic testing affordable and accessible broadly across the country. And that's going to be really pertinent data to collect, to advance the field as a whole, not just for clinical trials. Um, and then I'm just going to touch on the very last important point. It helps us identify and validate existing outcome assessments, right? So when you're talking about a clinical outcome assessment like the SARA, that's something that been, has been used over time to follow patients, but we need to gather data on how applicable is that in the clinical setting. And I think that um, all of these studies over years help us figure that out. And also to have quantitative markers. So for example, in the crc -SCA study, there are cerebrospinal fluid samples collected that look at different protein levels, also blood samples that are collected. And those will kind of help us pinpoint, are there markers of these in the blood or the cerebrospinal fluid that give us assays over time that correlate with disease severity? Um, also the ready Scott study uses imaging, so MRI. So how does the brain change over time with a given disease? Um, do you see shrinking of a certain area of the brain as patient symptoms progress? And can we use that to measure how a drug intervenes if, say, you study patients over time and that area no longer shrinks? Um, and then the IDEA study is another example of something uh, of a study uh, evaluating a quantitative biomarker. And it's a study that looks at sensors applied with the SARA scale. So there are sensors actually that are on your skin that give 
quantitative measurements in, in how patients are moving with the SARA. So it just gives us one more quantitative way of looking at prog patients' progression over time. And these are all gonna be critical, critical, sorry, for clinical trial development. And I also mentioned validation. By that, I just mean in these non-interventional studies, looking at these different markers, um, you can then transfer them into an interventional setting where we actually test them to see, do they accurately measure changes in an intervention and also changes over time? And is this applicable across the population? And that's how you kind of say, all right, this is a valid measure to use and to study this disease in. Um, so now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what a clinical trial actually is, right? So what do, what do we do on the drug development side of this in pharma? We actually have no hand at all, usually in implementing a given clinical trial, right? We don't have patients coming in and seeing us. What we do is we use all of the background information that I just talked about to help us develop a protocol. So what patients do we wanna recruit in our trial? How many patients do we need to have in our trial? What are our outcome measures gonna be? And in rare disease, we use a lot of help from our experts in the field, like Dr. Rosenthal. So we'll call her and say, look, we wanna use the Sarah scale. What do you think about this? It's been used in X studies and we all pull our brains and we come up with this protocol. And then we choose sites across the country that are actually gonna be conducting these trials. So in our case, especially in the rare disease space, we're looking for movement disorder specialists to conduct these trials, people like Dr. Rosenthal. So Dr. Rosenthal will take our protocol, she'll find patients who are interested in the study and she'll implement it. Now, what are the phases of these different clinical trials? So people here, you know, there's a phase one trial, a phase two trial. I'm gonna just briefly touch on what those are. Preclinical -pre research is what you do leading up to that. That's the bench side research on animals and tissue culture using a given intervention. Phase one is when you study that intervention in healthy people. So you just wanna know at what dose do you start to see side effects? Are there any side effects you would see where you wouldn't want to continue this, this drug into a different phase of research? Are there safety signals that are making you concerned? These are paid volunteers and they're very small numbers who enter these trials and you use them to figure out dosage um, and, and safety. Phase two trials are when you're using, you know, maybe a hundred, couple hundred patients to look at the drug in your diseased patients, in patients who have the, the disease you're studying, right? So you're looking not only for continued safety data, how safe is your drug, but importantly, you're looking for, is it effective in improving symptoms in this patient population? And then a phase three trial is really more of the same but using, we talked a little bit before about power of a trial, um, the ability to show a st statistically significant change from an intervent in an intervention in a patient population. And that requires numbers of patients. So the bigger your numbers, the greater your ability to detect a change. And that's going to change depending on what your intervention is, what your patient population is. But these trials can include a thousand patients. Um, and then phase four is just to let you know that even once a phase three trial is positive and we get the drug out to a patient population, we continue to gather real world data on the drug to continue to monitor safety um, for decades. And this is just to highlight that this is a really, really long process. So from bench side research, to approval of a drug, that can be 15 to 17 years, right? Um, you start with 10,000 compounds, you go all the way down to one drug, most that goes to show you that most drugs fail. Um, a significant number do not make it to preclinical testing and then only a tiny number make it to clinical testing. Of those of maybe five drugs that enter a phase two or phase three trial, only one drug actually ends up getting brought to patients. Um, and in the rare disease space, because our bars are even higher, that's an even harder milestone to get to. It also costs a lot of money. Um, depending on how long these drugs are, these trials go on and how difficult they are to recruit for, again, in the rare disease space, 
very challenging because you don't have a lot of patients with the given disease. Um, to bring one drug to market can be $2.6 billion. So it is a very uh, complex, long process, and we can talk about it a little more during the Q&A if you have any questions on this. So with all of this then, the clinical trials, even those, the five clinical trials on the five drugs, it often then leads to one approved drug. With each of these clinical trials, we learn things, and there's a huge role in clinical trials and understanding how to do the next trial better, but then also in understanding more about the disease itself and what's wrong and why are things certain things happening in the disease. So with this in mind, why do clinical trials fail? Why is it that those five drugs that only then lead to one approved drug? The first reason is that legitimately the drug or intervention doesn't work. So maybe it fails because despite all the preclinical evidence, all the animal studies, Ultimately, the drug or intervention simply does not work in the disease. Maybe that's why it fails. Alternatively, it could fail because not enough patients are enrolled in the study, so it's not adequately powered. And that's, again, where that powered thing comes in. And maybe if we had 100 more patients, we could actually detect a difference between people who are on placebo and people who are on active drug. And then the other reason that clinical trials fail is that our endpoint or our objective is not ideal. So especially in the world of ataxia, that qualitative endpoint that is the SARA that I'm sure you do when you go to see your doctor, it may not be the most ideal endpoint. We know that it can fluctuate based on if people are having a good or a bad day. It can even fluctuate based on how people feel in the morning versus in the evening. And so that may not be the most ideal objective and the most ideal endpoint. And so with that in mind, maybe the drug would be successful if we had a better endpoint. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very specific example of this. Um, so as I stated earlier, Biohaven did do the first registrational clinical trial in SCA in the United States. And, and we didn't have a lot of information to go to. Again, uh, a rare disease that has not been well studied. So it's not like dipping into the field of diabetes where your outcomes are all set, you know exactly what you're measuring, you know how many patients you need, you know how long you need to look at the disease for a given intervention. For this, we had a lot to learn. So in the initial design of our trial, um, we were looking at patients over the course of eight weeks. And it was that was our randomized placebo-controlled phase where half patients were on drug, half patients were on placebo. And at the end of that eight weeks, we did not see a difference between our placebo group and our treatment group. Probably a lot of reasons for that, but again, that was a failed trial. And we automatically had an open label phase added onto the trial where patients had the option to then all be on drug for a year, getting the same measurements over time. Um, this trial not only highlights the importance of a failed trial, but also the importance of natural history data and also of the patient voice. Because what ended up happening in this trial was our investigators started calling us as patients were completing the open label phase and saying, wait a second, you know, patients, certain patients were saying to us, we felt like we were not progressing over this year. And now that we're off drug, we feel like we're progressing. We had enough of our neurologists out there conducting these trials call us and say that and bring us the patient voice to say to ourselves, look, we need to look at that a little more closely. So we were lucky enough to have um, some data that Dr. Ashizawa, another movement disorder specialist in Texas, um, shared with us on the natural history data for patients in the trials in the United States. And so what we did was we did a matched comparison and we compared how patients had progressed on no drug in the natural history trial versus how our patients did over the course of a year on our drug, troriliazole. And again, it's not an ideal comparison, what you would love as a placebo, but we did have all this data to look at. And, and what you can see here is just in the natural history patient, in the natural history patients, which are on no intervention, no drug at all, they progressed about how you would expect in the SARA based on all the other natural history studies. So they declined um, in their illness by progressing a little over a point in their SARA. 
And what we saw in our patients who had been on trorilazole was that they actually had a slight improvement in their SARA at the end of a year. So this didn't give us any data that we could bring to the FDA to say, hey, you know, can we move forward with this drug? But what it did do was give us pause to say, okay, why did this trial fail? And we should definitely look at this drug again. So what did we learn? Um, we learned that the SARA scale, even though it's a phenomenal scale for clinicians to look at their patients over the course of their illness, which can be decades, maybe certain items of the SARA aren't the best thing to look at in a clinical trial where you're only looking for a small period of time. So the FDA had suggested to us that we really focus on you know, core items within the SARA. So patients' gait, patients' balance, patients' speech versus patients' fine motor or patients' appendicular items, which are like the finger to nose, the heel to shin. Because maybe over time, those don't contribute decent data. Maybe they're just contributing background noise. And sure enough, we looked at that within our data and we found some of that. It also showed us that there's a lot of variability in the SARA score, some of that we can't control. As patients know, you know, some days they wake up exhausted and they have a different SARA score from the day before when they weren't as exhausted. But what we can control is how, pay, how our clinicians are rating that scale. And that it was really important to come up with a very, very standardized way of not only the SARA being measured and scored, but the importance of having the same rater score to score. Um, it also showed us that we probably needed to look at patients who were progressing more rapidly. So to include more SCA 1, 2, and 3 patients in our trial. We also learned very quickly, right, that we had to look at SCA patients over a longer period of time. Eight weeks was just not a long enough time to look at um, patients in this trial because patients progress over so many years. We also learned that our drug dose was probably not high enough because we saw a different response in patients who were of a lower weight, patients who were in essence seeing a higher exposure of drug. But overall, our data showed that the drug was consistent with a potential therapeutic effect. We implemented all of these changes and now we're just finishing our second trial in SCA with a completely different study design, which we will have results um, for sometime in the near future. So preparing for not only our 206 trial, but future clinical trials, this is just a highlight that, that it can be very complicated in a rare disease, right? You have to combine everything that you learn from past trials. In this case, we don't have a lot to go on, but we did learn a lot from 201. We have to combine what we know from the natural history studies. We have to get optimum efficacy endpoints. So clinical outcome endpoints that show us a given change that's meaningful to patients in their disease over time with an intervention. And we also need to align with the regulators on this. And with that background data, there are actually some clinical trials that are now underway. So first is the antisense oligonucleotide study. And just a little bit of background on that. So we know that DNA becomes RNA becomes proteins. And what the ASOs do is they bind to the RNA and they stop it from making the bad protein. And there's actually very good preclinical evidence, so, so evidence in mice, that if the, an ASO specific to the SCA3 RNA will stop it from making the bad protein. And so there's actually now a clinical trial starting in SCA3, looking at um, using an ASO for SCA3 and coming soon, presumably down the pipeline, will be an ASO for SCA1 and SCA2. So what this study was able to do is take into account everything we have learned, both the natural history data and Biohaven's experience, to be able to design an ASO study for individuals with SCA3. Next slide. And then furthermore, in the future, there will be, we hope, a gene therapy trial for SCA3. Um, something that's administered to the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, one time. And the idea for this study will be to replace the SCA3 mutated gene with a non-mutated gene replacement. Um, and the one that's under development uses a viral vector to administer the gene. And for whatever this is worth, a viral vector is also used in the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. So these are some standard mechanisms that people are using to introduce sort of viral, viral vectors and gene therapy. And this is coming down the pipeline. 
And again, what this study will do is be able to use all of their previous experience to design hopefully an even better clinical trial along the way. Next slide. And it's important as we think about this to sort of look into the future in terms of advocacy and drug development. And the NIF has been really integral in this. So first is clinical trial readiness, which is what we've been talking about today. And NIF is doing a number of things on clinical trial readiness. They're looking to really identify patients because we need lots of patients for our study to be adequately powered. So there's online resources, there's membership, there's meetings like this, there's meeting times like this where we talk about clinical trials. Um, there's educational campaigns and there's the genetic counseling and testing initiative as well. And then NAF has also been very supportive of the natural history study, biospecimen collection of biomarkers, and that's all under that heading of clinical trial readiness. In addition then, once you start getting into regulatory acceptance, there oftentimes is advocacy at the regulatory level. So a good example of this is the uh, FARA, the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. What they did actually is there's a drug that is working its way toward approval for FA. And a number of um, patients and patient advocates and a huge letter writing campaign went underway to try to get the FDA to be able to look at that drug and advocate on behalf of that drug for possible approval. In addition then towards the future, after clinical trial readiness and after the drug is um, approved and after regulatory acceptance, at that point in the post-approval, there's the epidemiology part, and then the payers and budget holders. And where this becomes important is there could be a great drug that goes through this entire process, gets accepted, but ultimately if your insurance company doesn't pay for it, it is really difficult for then physicians to prescribe it because it'll be incredibly expensive. Um, and so that's sort of where the post-approval part comes in, in terms of working with insurance companies, try to make sure they cover the cost of the drugs. And these are all the things that need to come together in order for a drug to be successful and to, for all of us to be clinical trial ready. And, and just to wrap this slide up, I wanna let everybody know here that none of what we've talked about today exists in a bubble. So NAF has initiated a drug development collaborative, just as one example, where all of the pharma people who are working in these clinical trials and our doctors out in the field we all come together with the patient advocacy group to discuss the data that we have and to integrate all of our information so that we can advance the field together. And thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. And we are open to any questions you have. Getting a rare incurable disease that results in disability is the type of thing you don't think will ever happen to you. It has definitely made me slow down and realize what's important in life. After getting the diagnosis, I pretty much ignored it. I still did not quite believe that it was real. I just kept living as I normally did. I did not make many changes to my life. When symptoms did get worse, I stopped going out as much as I used to. I did try to hide and mask my symptoms from people as much as I could, including family and friends. I participate in the trials not only for myself, but I want to be as close as I can be to treatments or even better yet, a cure so that I can be as strong as I can for my family and for my friends as well. I'm flying out from Las Vegas to California for the Clinical Trail in UCLA and I'm playing on JSX airline. If you don't know about JSX, it's a semi-private airline and if you have a problem walking, 
any kind of movement disorder, ataxia, or any other disorder. This one is um, much more convenient because you do not have to walk through the entire airport, <laughs> which is really cool. And the pricing is a bit more, but if you just have a short trip, it's actually not that much at all. I'm flying from Vegas to LA, so it's really not that much. And you only have to check in about 20, 30 minutes before you fly, actually depart. So it's so convenient. I'm trying it out for the first time, and so far I just walked in, checked my bag, about to take off here soon. Departure the Vegas area. The rest of the flight should be mostly smooth. Current weather out of Los Angeles, very sky, light winds in the west. yesterday and so that's done and right now I'm actually spending some time, time with my family I did see some friends as well so actually that's another benefit of traveling for clinical trials I can use the downtime to connect with people I haven't seen in a while or to catch up on work so yeah tomorrow's day three of my four-day uh, round trip I fly out to Texas on Monday morning it, they do have wheelchair service, which I did not know about before. It's very helpful. So normally I walk with a cane, just like short distances, but for longer distances, those are really tough. Anyone with a movement disorder would know about that. It's been very helpful, so I'd recommend doing that. Just got to Texas, and in time for the pretty sunset. Tired, so this will be pretty quick. I had my appointment in Houston, Texas this morning at Houston Methodist Hospital. That appointment was mainly physical exam, a few time tests, like the peg test. You put in tiny little uh, stick pegs into little holes and they time you to see how long it takes. The walking balance test. Um, and a bunch of questions. Um, they also took a skin, a tiny skin sample from me as well. So all this will hopefully help their study so they can find treatments for ataxia or even better yet, a cure. I'm back home in Vegas. I've had a couple of days of rest. I'm still a bit tired actually, I think I realized it when I was on the go, when I was traveling. But now that I'm back home, I can definitely feel it caught up with me now. <laughs> but that's okay. I can rest up. I'm not concerned. Next time, I'll probably space them out for sure. If I ever have to, like that, I have to do. I'll try and space them out next time. People are reluctant or hesitant to participate because they think that there might be some kind of pain involved with the trial. I will let you know that I have never been in pain in the trials. Just communicate to your doctor what's going on because you're a team working together. So, uh, and they don't want to see you in pain, of course. So just communicate to them what's going on and they'll make suggestions um, and that could very well quickly, easily clear up what's going on. Thank you so much again for following along. I hope this has provided some insight to uh, how it is to be involved in cl clinical trials. And if you have any other questions, you can shoot me a direct message. Um, if there's something I'll left, I've left out that you're cur curi curious about, I'd be more than happy to answer. All right, thank you guys and have a good night.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A portion of the clinical trial readiness session. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for being here um, and willing to join us today. We only have time for a few questions, um, so we'll get to as many as we can, and I'll just jump right in. Um, our first question is for Christy. So a few of, it, a few of our attendees are curious, what's going on um, with your clinical trial ready or clinical trial now? Absolutely. Um, so I'm in the Biohaven study and I participate, I attend, I go for my visits rather every three months. So I'm still, it's been over two years now and I um, am still in it. And um, I go every three months for my follow up visits. Great. Thank you. Um, and the next question is for Dr. Rosenthal and Dr. Biner. Um, how is research shared and is it shared? And then um, it's a two part question. The second part is how close are we to a disease altering drug? Um, I'll take the first part. Research is definitely shared. Um, there's a couple of different mechanisms through which research is shared. The uh, natural history study, which is um, also called the CRCSCA, which is supported by the National Ataxia Foundation, that, um, that is multi-site and we all enter our data into the same website. And it's a secure website that only researchers have access to. But once you get access, that is shared not only with people who contribute the data, but also any researcher worldwide can actually ask for that data, download it, and uh, use that data in their own research as well. We also then share samples. Um, so the blood samples and the spinal fluid samples, those are also shared amongst researchers as well. And there's a mechanism by which those are shared. Um, and then finally, I'll let Dr. Bino talk about the drug development group that the NAF has through which we, data is also shared. Yeah, thank you. So um, I did touch on this a little bit towards the end of the talk. So NAF established a drug development consortium where um, our clinicians, researchers in the pharma field, um, and advocacy group members, we all come together and we talk about our studies and we talk about our research and we share our data and we share our information. And the reason NAF organized this was so that there will be very effective communication for all of us because every little bit of research helps every single one of us. And it will go much more quickly in advancing the field if we all share. And even on a more global level, uh, there's something called the clinical path to ataxia, where we're actually sharing research information with researchers, clinicians, pharma companies that are actually in Europe and across the globe. Um, and then I think the second part of the question was, when do we anticipate some answers for clinical trials? So. Uh, Biohaven uh, expects to release our results for our clinical trial and have our results within the next two months. So we're eagerly awaiting that and we're very hopeful. Um, if for whatever reason that's a failed trial or whatever our results um, of our trial are, Dr. Rosenthal highlighted some of the other trials that are coming down the pike. And I think that's gonna continue. There's a lot of pharma interest right now in the ataxia space. So I think there are gonna be more and more clinical trials that get added to the list as the years go on. It's an exciting time for this field. I had just one, one other thing. I think the importance of collaboration amongst researchers and pharmaceutical companies is actually absolutely critical. And I think especially in this rare disease space, I think people are really welcoming of working together and collaborating and of um, you know working both amongst different academic researchers and then also collaborating with pharmaceutical companies. So I think it really is a, um, a very collaborative environment that we all are working in. Great, thank you. And this question is kind of open to anyone who's ready to answer it, um, but what's the difference between a study and a clinical trial? I'm happy to jump in on that one. I mean, I think anything that is that is research constitutes a study, right? So you can be doing a study at the preclinical level, at the bench side, to understand the pathophysiology of a disease that doesn't involve patients, that doesn't involve humans. Um, you can be doing animal research in a given in animal models of a given disease. Any of that constitutes kind of a study. A clinical trial is a study that involves humans. So for phase one, that would be healthy patients. For phase two and above, 
that would be patients who actually have the given disease. Awesome, thank you. Um, we had another question about how to find clinical trials. Um, how can we find them? Maybe if Christy, you wanna to touch on how you found yours, if you're comfortable. Yeah, um, definitely. I signed up on the CORDS registry um, and I was uh, someone to reach out to me, actually Sue Hagen reached out to me from NAF, Sue from NAF reached out to me and let me know the studies I, would, uh, I, I was eligible to participate in. So shout out to Sue. Thank you so much. Great. And clinicaltrials.gov. I think everybody, a lot of people are familiar with this site, but if if your specific neurologist um, doesn't have information on every single trial that's out there, you can go into clinicaltrials.gov, which is a site that has all the clinical trials actually across the globe that participate registered. So you go onto this site and then you can enter spinocerebellar ataxia, multiple system atrophy, whatever the disorder is, and it will bring up all the trials that are going on. Great, thank you so much. Um, that is all the time we have for questions today, very quick, um, but feel free to um, continue to reach out to us and ask more questions about clinical trials um, and stay up to date on PrepRare, which is the National Ataxia Foundation's Clinical Trial Readiness Initiative. There are lots of topics and webinars and articles coming um, for about that. Um, and so thank you again to all of our speakers for taking the time and speaking with us today. Um, we have a bit of a break before the next session, which is fun and great, fun and games, which will happen about 15 minutes after the hour. But thank you um, again so much and have a great rest of your AAC.